always thought if I didn't get tenure, I would shoot myself or strap a bomb to my chest and walk into the faculty cafeteria. <laughs> but when it happened, I just got bourbon drunk and cried a lot and rolled into a ball on my office floor. A couple of days of this and I couldn't take it. So I ended classes a week early and I checked into the Aquaba bed and breakfast in Harlem to be among my own race and party away the pain. But mostly I found myself back in that same ball some more, still on the floor, just in a more historically resonant address. <laughs> my buddy Garth Frierson, he'd been laid off about six months before and it was nice enough for him to drive all the way from Detroit to help a childhood friend. This mostly consisted of him sitting his bus driver ass on my rented bed, <laughs> busting on me until I had enough shame to get off my own duff and try to make something of myself again. By then, the term was over. Graduation done, campus vacant. I, I didn't want to see anybody. The only thing worse than the ones who were happy about my dismissal were the ones that weren't. The sympathy, the condolences, it was all so white. I was the only black male professor on campus, a professor of African American literature, professional Negro. Over the years since my original hire, I pushed away from that and insisted on teaching American literature in general, following a path towards my passion, towards Edgar Allan Poe. Specifically, I offered the course Dancing with the Darkies, Whiteness <laughs> in the Literary Mind, twice a year, regardless of enrollment. In regard to that number of students who chose to attend the seminar, I must say in my defense that the greatest ideas are often presented to empty chairs. <laughs> <laughs> However, a different theory on proper class size was cited in my denial letter from the president and given as a reason to overturn the faculty's approval. Curing America's racial pathology couldn't be done with good intentions of presidential elections. Like all diseases, it had to be analyzed at a microscopic level. What I discovered during my studies in Poe and other early American texts was the intellectual source of racial whiteness. Here, in these pages, was the fossil record of how this odd and illogical sickness formed. Here was the twisted mythic underpinnings of modern racial thought that could never be dismantled before because we were standing upon them. You don't cure an illness by ignoring it or just fighting the symptoms. A Kleenex has never eradicated a cold. I was doing essential work, work affecting domestic policy, foreign policy, the entire social fabric of the most powerful nation in the world, work that related directly to the way we lived our daily lives and perceived reality itself. Who cared if a bunch of overprivileged 19-year-olds with questionable hygiene could be bothered to rise for an 8 a.m. class? Who cared if I chose not to waste even more precious research time attending the toothless diversity committee? <laughs> Just get your books, dog, and get out of there. Pack up your place, focus on what you can do. You want, you can come back with me to Detroit, it's cheap, I got a big crib, ain't no jobs, but still. <laughs> Garth and I drove up the Taconic in the rain. I was still drunk, and the wet road was like lines on a snake's back, and my stomach was going to spill. Even drunk, I knew an escape plan that involved going to Detroit, Michigan, was a harbinger of doom. <laughs> Garth Frierson was my boy from when we were boys, from when I lived in a basement apartment in Philly, and he lived over the laundry mat next door. Garth didn't even ask how many books I had, but he must have suspected, because I had books. I had books like a lit professor has books, and then I had more books, finer books, first editions, rare prints, copies signed by hands long dead. Angela walked out on me a long time ago, and my chance at children walked with her, but I had multiplied in my own way. <laughs> I had shelves built in my office for these books, shelves 10 feet tall and completely lining the drywall. The campus was dead, a, a vacant compound hidden from the road by darkness and hulking pines. The gravel parking lot was empty, but I made Garth park in the spot that said, President, violators will be towed on principle. <laughs> when you get denied tenure at a college like this, intimate, good but not great, your career is over. 
a decade of job preparation, no one else will hire you. If you haven't published enough, people assume tenure denial means you never will. If you have published and were still denied, people will assume you're an asshole. <laughs> Nobody wants to give a job for life to an asshole. <laughs> and they didn't have to in this economy. Outside of a miracle, after a denial, I would be lucky to scrounge up an adjunct teaching at a community college somewhere very cold, barren, far from the ocean, a life with little health insurance, bill collectors, and a classroom with metal detectors. All compliments of this Mr. President. Mr. Bowtie. The least I could do is shit in his face for an hour. <laughs> we trudged. The building looked like an old church that lost its faith. Every step up its staircase a sacrilege. Garth huffed, but he followed. I'd chosen an office in the back of the top floor to dissuade students, but my lectures had done a better job of this. <laughs> my office was narrow, an A-frame cathedral with a matching window, a shrine to the books that lined the walls on, and my own solitude. Bro, I'm not going to lie to you. I got a lot of books in here, I said letting him in first. You do? Garth asked me. Because I didn't. It was empty. I should have been greeted with hundreds of colored spines of literary loves, but there was nothing. My books were gone. My office had been cleared out. Everything was gone. My pictures, my lamp, my Persian rug, everything not school property or nailed down, gone. A chasm of vacant whitewashed bookshelves opened up before me. I was Breathless. Garth was out of breath, but for him it was just all the stairs. <laughs> they took all my shit, man. They took my shit. I kept repeating. I walked over to the desk and pulled out all the drawers. There were some chewed yellow pencils left, a few folded post-its and bent paper clips, but that was not what I was looking for. I kept searching, desperate, sliding pencils and papers around, looking for more. Damn, dog. You didn't have no porn in there, did you? <laughs> Garth already had his little Debbie out and was chewing on it like it was his reward for making it up three floors of 19th century stairs. Just a picture, I told him. A picture of what? Angela, I admitted. Worse, Garth said, head wagging. I slammed the drawer <laughs> shut and it was loud and I liked that sound. A moment of violence, but this time coming from me. So then I started banging out the empty shelves with my fist, and they vibrated. You could hear the echo in the room, then bouncing off into the empty building beyond us until Garth closed the door. That's wrong, man. Disrespectful. Forget them. Job's over. That's life. What are you going to do? I was going to show up at the president's house and kick his ass. <laughs> this actually seemed like the only thing worth running away to Detroit for. I didn't tell Garth this because he would have stopped me. He was big enough to fill up the door. He was even bigger since he'd been laid off. Wait in the car, man. I, I just have to check my mail, I told him. Garth did it. I, I am a bad liar, but he was tired and it was really cold outside, and brothers don't like the cold, Matthew Henson excluded. <laughs> it was late spring, but it had been raining for a week, and upstate New York was frigid in a way which more gothic an impure than Philly chill could ever manage. You drunk, I'm tired as hell. The sooner you get your ass out of here, the sooner you get your ass out of here, Garth offered, but he left. So then I walked over to the president's house to punch him and maybe kick him a few times. In my head, I was getting gangster, which I've always felt showed greater intent than getting gangster, and that it expresses a willful unlawfulness even upon its own linguistic representation. <laughs> I was going to show him how we do where I'm from. Go straight Philly on him. And I knew all about that, because although I had never actually punched someone in the face before, as a child, I myself had been on the receiving end of the act several times, and I was a quick study. The president's house was at the other end of the campus, but it was a small liberal arts campus an empty space, dorms, and building deserted solar street lamps popping on and off just for me. While I was walking, stroking my anger, thinking of all the work I'd done and all that security I was now being denied, I came to the administration building and I saw that there was a light on downstairs in the back in the president's office. No one just left interior lights on. The environmental footprint was too massive, the cost too high, and with every attack, the prices went higher. So he was in there. The outside door opened, and I knew he was in there. And then there was this overwhelming emotion. 
It was not rage or anger. It was something even more illicit, <coughs> unwanted. It was hope. Here we were, two men, alone, society vacated, and now just two men and a problem, one that somehow, in my stupor, seemed workable. There was a guy down the hall, a romanticist, who had been denied tenure 10 years ago, approved by the faculty committee, just as I was, only to be shot down by the same president in the same manner. And he had, in his grief, approached this all-powerful boss man and had repented all of his sins, real and imagined, and was granted a permanent teaching gig. It made sense, too. For as Frederick Douglass's narrative tells us, that it's more valuable to a master to have a morally broken slave than to have a confident one. <laughs> the romanticist story had always seemed humiliating to me before this moment, but suddenly it became inspirational. At the present story, I paused, prepared myself for what could simply be the final test before I overcame my troubles. I took a deep breath to prepare myself for the performance of dignified groveling. Then I heard the music coming from inside. And what I saw scared me. It took me out of my confidence, my momentum. What do you make of a Jew sitting in the dark listening to Wagner in this day and age? I can think of no more call to the end of the world than the one I was looking at. Random violence on the news had become background noise to me at this point, but the scene genuinely scared my ass. Still in his bow tie and tweed jacket at this time of the night, it was disgusting. He hit his keyboard quickly, and suddenly the sound became Mahler. But I knew, I knew, <laughs> I knew what I'd heard. As the sound cleansed the room, the bald man just looked at me, drink in hand. As drunk as I was, I could still smell the sweet sting of alcohol hanging in the air. My shit! It came out. <laughs> it lacked the eloquence of a planned rebuttal, but he understood. <laughs> Packed by movers, delivered to your listed residents, a thank you, really, for your service. Thank you. He said that last bit as if I should be saying that to him. But still, it robbed me of a bit of my momentum. I had been surviving on righteous indignation and self-pity for weeks, and I, I realized once the supply seemed threatened. But then I remembered I'd been canned, and my fuel line kicked in once more. It is because I refuse to be on the diversity committee? I demanded. I was loud. The halls were empty. The echo enhanced my argument. Well, that certainly would have, he began, but seeing I was hearing every word, already planning my deposition for my discrimination lawsuit, he stopped himself. Your file was examined as a whole. You were hired to teach African American literature, not just American literature. You fought that, simple. So you want the black guy to just teach black books to white kids. We have a large literature faculty. They can handle the majority of literature. You were retained to pervade the minority perspective. I see nothing wrong with that. He shrugged, poured a second drink in a glass and pushed it forward to me with the base of his bottle. You have academics going off the farm all the time. Yates scholars who end up following their way to Proust. You have a film professor who was hired as a German linguist. <laughs> <laughs> a Guggenheim, a Fulbright, and a Roll Scholar. Mr. James, you, you have accomplished no such honor or distinction. I do not mean that as an insult, just an unfortunate reality. A big part of me hurt a lot hearing this said aloud, in a big way. I blushed, and as pale as I was, I blushed possibly as no black man had done before me. <laughs> <laughs> Staring at him, I settled myself looking at his tie, his bastard tie. Look at it. That bow tie was hypnotizing. Usually men of power use useless fabric tied around their necks, but this was smaller and tied at a different angle. No big phallic thing for this guy. No, it was even worse. It was, look at me. I have an itty bitty micro phallic tie around my neck. Still, I have all the power. <laughs> Please, listen to me, I pleaded. My work, it's about finding the answer to why we have failed to truly become a post-racial society. It's about finding a cure. A thousand Baldwin and Ellison essays can't do this. You have to go to the source. That's why I started focusing on Poe. If we can identify how the pathology of whiteness was constructed, then we can learn to dismantle it. The work I'm doing, it's just books, 
sure, but it's important, essential research. You're going to fire me for refusing to sit on the campus diversity committee? <laughs> you could have compensated for your lack of national presence by embracing our role locally, but alas, he told me and looked away. Everyone has a role to play. I put my hand out to him, and before he could meet my palm with his own, I reached higher and I grabbed the tie in his neck. It was a clip-on and it came off easily. When I yanked it off with my fist, I was right about it being the source of his power. He was totally quiet after it was done. I didn't hear a peep from up behind me as I ran from the confrontation. When I got to the car, I told Garth that my academic career was probably over. But since I've been saying the same thing for a couple of days, he just turned to, tuned me out and tuned the radio back in. I went to the bar. Garth was tired from driving, so stayed back. On the way, I made a call to my lawyer, and hopefully one to my antiquarian that I could purchase more first editions with my settlement. There was one bar in town, and there was a black guy sitting in it. And this I took as a divine miracle, maybe even another sign of my impending turn of fortune. It was a town of only 1,163, just eight miles north of campus. Aside from a handful of students during term, there were no black people in the area. In the summer tourism months, on occasion, you could spot a black woman with her white partner passing through, but often these visitors were particularly disinclined to co-ethnic bonding. <laughs> this brother wasn't, though. When I walked in, he looked up and smiled at me like he knew me, and I gave him the nigga nod, and he gave me right back, so I knew we were cool. I sat down next to him. <laughs> Mosaic Johnson, hip-hop theorist. Of course he was an academic. Of course I was. There was no other reason for two obviously educated black men to be there. And it was obvious, even of him, dressed as he was in his carefully selected baggy jeans, hat to the side, and other matching oversized pop culture juvenilia. But he was a professor of music, so allowances could be made for styling. Chris James, Americanist. And our fists bumped in black academic bliss. <laughs> Mr. Johnson was a younger man than I in both years and manner, dressed like he was straight out of Compton, but clearly straight out of a postdoc instead. <laughs> Just arrived in town to start teaching the following term, coming in the summer because his lease in Chicago was up, and, uh, and this was his future. Eager, earnest, through drunken eyes, I looked at Mosaic Johnson, and I saw myself there. I, I saw myself showing up in this town, seeing it as a foreign territory I was hopeful to invade. 21 years of academic training culminating in permanent entrenchment on the business side of the classroom. Theory finally turned into the practice, a practice of yapping about theory. <laughs> Just like me, I wept for this bastard. <laughs> Don't join the diversity. <laughs> I told him when the third round hit. We've been talking a while, for a minute, mostly bemoaning the history of Dutch slavery in the area, but he hung with me. A squat dude whose only thinness was his mustache. Mosaic seemed to roll a bit away from me when I said this, but I leaned in closer because he needed to hear it. These historically white institutions, they get that one black professor, they put him on something they call the diversity committee. Don't let them put you there. It's a slave hold. They'll fight you. They really want you on the diversity committee because if there aren't any minorities on the committee, the committee isn't diverse. <laughs> Man, in my work, I deal with the ghetto, the real shit, you know? Reality, he told me. Motioning around the room with a silver ringed hand as if our present setting was a mere computer simulation. <laughs> I'm not trying to run from the folks. I want to be on that committee. I'm a fighter. I want to be on that committee to bring the fight here. The hand in the air formed into a fist. I looked around the room at the 20 or so white liberals taking him in on the sly. Mm -hmm. They loved it. They loved that fist. <laughs> If I was still here tomorrow, they would come up to me and ask me why I never raised the black power fist like the new guy. Undaunted, I continue. No, you don't. And I'll tell you why. The diversity committee has one primary purpose, 
so that the school can say it has a diversity committee. They need that for when students get upset about race issues or general ethnic stuff. It allows the faculty and administration to point to it and go, everything's going to be fine. We have formed a committee. People find that very relaxing. It's sort of like if you had a fire, and instead of putting it out, you formed a fire committee. <laughs> but none of the ideas that come out of all that committing have ever been implemented. Nothing the committee has suggested in 30 years has ever been funded. It is a gerbil weir meant to keep that nigga boy running. Ellison, he smiled. You know, Chris James, I've read some of your early work, your Ellison theory. That had to be. Why don't you bring it like that no more, he asked me. And, and I glowed at this. Old musicians asked to play their classical songs. They, they must get this feeling. You're tired of it, sure, but at least somebody cares. I thanked him, told him how I've developed, how I've been drawn toward 19th century fiction at Grand Pop. <laughs> as I'm getting up to hit the John, right as I'm turning away, Mosaic Johnson says, man, nobody cares about the Poe thing. And I laughed back at him and told him, thanks for getting my pain in moments like this. And then I went off to piss him. In the can, standing in front of the urinal, I was still for the moment. It felt like it was the first time I was truly still since this whole disaster had started. Even when I was pulled into a ball on the floor, I was rocking and reeling internally. But this bathroom, this empty bathroom, it was like a temple. <laughs> Utterly serene. And within that silence, clarity came to me. I started thinking about my past and my new friend. And I started thinking about everything he had said, all of his responses. And I was surprised to find a previously undetected negative tone there. <laughs> Not in his words, but in the little performances of his demeanor, his last statement being irrefutable proof of this. You're not in the music department, are you? I said to him on my return, I didn't even sit down. I was standing, I was shaking. My voice was cracking a little bit too, which was beyond my control. No, I'm, I'm not. My instrument is the QWERTY keyboard, he admitted. Took the last swig from his Hennessy, then swiveled to face me. You're here to replace me, aren't you? You're here to take my job, take my office. That's why you're in this bar tonight, isn't it? Man, just relax. It ain't nothing personal. Yes, I'm the new hire. Yes, it was your tenure line. I never said I was a music prop. I said I was a hip hop theorist, okay? That's my school of literary criticism, right? I'm here to bring the beat to the text. That's it. It's all good. And hell yes, I represent myself as a strong black man when I'm on this campus. Right. You're here to be the diversity committee. <laughs> <laughs> Look, cuz, unlike you, clearly, I believe in trying to change things, fighting racism where I see it. I don't back down. I don't apologize for that either. Hell yeah, I'm down for the damn committee. I'm down <laughs> for the fight. You know what I'm saying? A PhD can manage, can't manage a lot of menace, but we are good at reading between the lines. <laughs> I knew exactly what he meant, no footnotes needed. Still, I stepped in closer. You know what I think? I think that when you fight the same battles with the same tactics, you don't get any further. That unless you address the roots of the problem, it will continue to grow. This was fairly eloquent for me, given that it was off the cuff. No peer review or rewrites. And I was proud that I had thought of it there, and not later in the spirit of the stairs. It was the arrogance that brought on by the success that made me pause two steps into my exit, turn, and continue. And white folks here know that, and they like it that way. You're hired to be the angry black guy, get it? You're not fighting whiteness, you're feeding its perversion. You're here so that you, they can deal with their guilt without making them change a damn thing. They want you to be the diversity committee because every village needs a fool. Still, I felt I was sticking to my thesis closely, not diverting off into too much bullshit. If Mosaic Johnson kept his mushy buttocks on the stool instead of getting in my face, then it would have been a decent closer. <laughs> oh, I get it. I get it now. Why you love Poe? You two share one big thing in common. Neither one of you is a damn bit relevant anymore. <laughs>
This college can really use you, I returned, preparing myself to hoof it. Every good zoo needs a gorilla. It was an inflammatory statement. <laughs> I lit that shit on fire, too. Just for watching that. Even I was offended. <laughs> and that's why I chose that level of toxic phraseology to hit him. He hit me back, though. First in the gut, and then when I went down on the floor in several other places. <laughs> Mosaic Johnson could definitely bring the beat. To me personally, he brought the beat down. <laughs> Not to be confused with the downbeat. Ho doesn't matter, he said as he pummeled. And I respected him for that, though. He guessed correctly his weak suburban mini mall kung fu punches might not be enough to hurt me. <laughs> Tika Lily! I laughed as the crowd pulled Mosaic Johnson from my body. Tika Lily! Thank you. <laughs>